and uh, that's the good news. That so, jetzt zur, zum nächsten Teil. Es wird jetzt ein bisschen experimentell, weil wir jetzt keine Probe machen konnten. Als nächstes kommt Myron Abel. Myron Abel wird kurz, sehr, sehr kurz, das weiß er, dass wir keine Zeit mehr haben, einen Einblick geben über was ich drei Jahre nach der Präsidentschaftswahl, wie sieht die amerikanische Klimapolitik aus. Und während ich hier spreche, werden die Kollegen der Technik jetzt den Skype-Call aufbauen. Und ganz kurz zu Myron Abel. Wer ist Myron Abel? Er ist vom Competitive Enterprise Institute, der Mann, der praktisch für die Klimapolitik zuständig ist. Er leitet auch die Cooler Heads Coalition. Die Cooler Heads Coalition ist ein, ein Zusammenschluss, nein, ein Treffen regelmäßig von zwölf Organisationen in den USA, die einfach die menschengemachte Klimahypothese kritisch sehen und auch was das Thema Energienormen angeht. Und er war eben im äh, sogenannten ähm, äh, President's Team of ähm, President Trump elect. Okay, Myron, I see you're You are, you are here. Okay, excellent. So just give us a quick rundown for what's going on now, three years after the election. Uh, well, thank you, Wolfgang. I'm, I'm really sorry I can't be with you, but I, want, I hope that your conference has been a great success. Um, I know you've, it's uh, taken place under some uh, difficult circumstances, and I hope that made it even better. Um, uh, Well, I, th I think I mostly have good news from, from Washington, D.C., the, the center of the universe. Um, uh, President Trump, uh, as you know, promised during the campaign in 2016 to, to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Treaty. Uh, on November 4th of this year, uh, the State Department sent the letter on the first day that it was legally possible under the terms of the treaty The State Department sent the letter to the UN Secretary General announcing that our withdrawal will take effect on the first day that it legally can under the treaty, uh, and that is uh, November 4th, uh, 2020, uh, the day after our general election. Uh, so uh, I think that's very good news. This is the largest uh, deregulatory action, and I think one of the most uh, politically Uh, difficult actions that the president has undertaken. Uh, he did say uh, at a speech in Pittsburgh uh, in late October, he said, you know, every, everybody told me how tough this was going to be to get out of Paris, uh, but, but every time I bring it up, people uh, cheer and applaud. So I think it, it remains immensely popular in the United States. Uh, the, the other deregulatory actions uh, of the Trump administration on energy and climate uh, are, are moving forward, but some of them have been slower than we hoped. Partly that's due to the incompetence or, or, or lack of, of, of uh, uh, you know, experience of some of the people doing it. Uh, some of it's due to the, the opposition of the deep state, particularly at the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, you know, we have the, uh, uh, the, the so-called Clean Power Plan has been repealed. Uh, it's in court, of course. The environmental groups in many states are suing. Uh, so it is now possible, once again, uh, to build a new coal-fired power plant in this country. Uh, there is one on the board uh, that might be built, uh, and I hope that in the next five to ten years some, some more uh, will be built. Uh, we have uh, other rules. The CAFE rules on fuel economy in vehicles is, uh, uh, is moving forward. California has been told that they can't run it, that California is not in charge of what kinds of cars Americans can buy, uh, and, uh, and that the EPA and the Department of Transportation will figure that out, not California. And, of course, California is suing. Um, Uh, so these rules are moving forward, and I think they'll all be final before, uh, you know, next, late next spring. Uh, and uh, that's the good news. The, on the other side, uh, some states have decided that they are going to take the path of the European Union uh, and starve themselves of energy, increase energy costs for consumers and producers, Uh, drive manufacturing out, drive energy production out. They're led by California, but also New York uh, and the New England states like Massachusetts. Uh, but the heartland states uh, have responded really quite dramatically 
uh, to the Trump deregulatory agenda. Uh, manufacturing is coming back to places like Ohio and Indiana, where electric rates are still low. Uh, some these this is an area of the country, the heartland states, uh, the, the near mid east, that has been in uh, stagnant or in decline for the past 20 years up until 2017. Uh, and you now see, uh, I, I've, I've visited uh, many uh, towns and cities in the last few months uh, in that part of the world, and you see that uh, people are optimistic. Uh, one uh, manufacturer who's been, in, he's been in coal mining and he's been in manufacturing told me a couple of weeks ago, uh, after, and he's in his, I think, late 70s, he told me that, the, that President Trump has been better for the economy in his part of the world, the, the Ohio, West Virginia, Indiana, than any other president. And his wife, who was sitting next to us at lunch, said, well, but what about Reagan? And he said, no, Reagan was great. Reagan did a lot of good things. But on the economy, the Trump agenda has been better for us, and things are really looking up. So I think uh, we have we are a beacon to the world. We are showing an alternative path of, of light and uh, energy, uh, and uh, this is uh, going to be uh, you know uh, it's going to become more and more apparent that the path that Europe and California have chosen uh, is is the wrong one. Uh, it's it's bad for people. Uh, it doesn't do anything for the climate. As you know, global emissions keep going up. There hasn't. The curve has not been bent uh, as a result of 30 years of energy rationing policies uh, to subsidize and mandate uh, more expensive types of energy. So, uh, so the EU and California and your other allies have achieved nothing. Uh, and the United States has, has uh, said that officially we're on the path of abundant and affordable energy. The United States, as a result of the shale oil revolution, it's now the world's largest producer of oil and gas. Uh, for a couple of months this year, for the first time since 1949, the United States is a net exporter of oil. Uh, in 2020, I think that the U.S. will be a next net exporter of oil every single month. The U.S. is a net exporter of natural gas. Uh, and so we are, instead of having hundreds of billions of dollars every year in uh, trade deficits, trade deficits over oil uh, and gas, we are now uh, making money in the in global trade on oil and gas, and that's a tremendous boon to our economy. So I think things are, on, on the whole, they're looking good. We've got the problem of California, New York, and a few other states, but I think uh, generally uh, the American people are pretty happy that our gasoline costs about uh, what one quarter of what yours costs or, or one third. Uh, and uh, not in California, it's closer to you. It's up to around a dollar or maybe even a euro per liter in California. But it's a lot less than that uh, where I live here on the East Coast in uh, Washington, D.C. So I'll leave it at that, Wolfgang, and I hope uh, you have, have had a great conference. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there, but it's nice to uh, have this uh, brief uh, connection to you all. Okay. Okay. Okay, Th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Myron. Okay, see you sometime soon. Okay, bye then. Have a nice, have Very a nice good. day. Very Okay, Thank bye you. then. Bye. Okay, die Frage- und Antwortrunde, die machen wir bei der nächsten Konferenz.